Welcome to concert number whatever. Today's, uh, today's um, well it's, it's really a presentation more than a concert. I'm, I'm, no, I'm hesitating to say lecture because it's not. There's going to be some interactivity and some listening and some, uh, some uh, personal engagement with you as musicians, as studying musicians. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Sean Botha, who's going to uh, talk about and present uh, the ideas behind and the and the uh, the details of a an analysis system that he's been working on. He I first met Sean in 2005. Uh, I remember him dropping by the office and saying, "Are you into spectral music?" And I had no idea what spectral music was. And so we had a nice conversation about what spectral music was. Uh, and as with all things, it was really about terminology. I sort of understood what the music was, but I didn't call it spectral music. I didn't realise there was a whole culture and a history of uh, what's termed spectral music. And so are you going to... There's an explanation of this in there. There will be some kind of reference. Some yes. kind of reference some to it. Some kind of reference. So, uh, <laughs> completed an honours degree here mm. in 2005 with uh, Associate Professor Diana Blom as his supervisor and then began a PhD, which is... It's Dr Sean Botha? Almost. 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 <laughs> Almost complete. Feels weird. So... Uh, <laughs> Looking at textual, and uh, her PhD uh, topic was textual analysis through the lens of spectral morphology. And we'll get more details of that as we go. Influenced by John Cage, a uh, composer and uh, musical thinker I've spoken about to some of you. Um, uh, Dennis Smalley, an Australian composer uh, who works in this way as well. And uh, Olivia Messian, and if you want to look up a piece of music by Messian, you can look at the Quartet for the End of Time, which is a beautiful piece of music you might like to immerse yourself in. So, without any further ado, soon to be Dr. Sean <laughs> Botha. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> awesome. So, I, was, um, I tend to be rather cheeky. Um, in how I approach things. So I, I like, I'm the type of person that comes in and introduces themselves as I'm the rogue one, like rogue one from Star Wars, because I'm a complete and utter Star Wars nut. So, um, done a few bits and pieces of um, three minute presentations. So, you kind of look up people to see how they approach three minute presentations, and it's interesting. So, you kind of want to get to the moral of the story pretty fast. So, the big thing about what I'm showing you today is sound. But before we even look at sound, we want to address the word, emphasis on the word silence. Silence does not exist. And we know this because of John Cage. John Cage went, in, went into an, an echoic chamber at Harvard, and he found that he could hear his heartbeat, he could hear his own breathing, he could hear the electricity in his own body moving up his spine, moving throughout his body, creating movement. So there's no such thing as silence. Silence is an idea that somebody thought up. It's a concept. So we're throwing silence completely out the window and we're saying that right here, right now, you're constantly surrounded by sound. Even just the whispering is a sound. That slight movement of your foot, kicking very lightly against the chair, that sound. When you're clearing your throat, that sound. When I'm walking backwards, that sound. So it comes down to the following. How do we listen? How do we work with sound? And how do we interact with sound? Working with sound and interacting with sound, we can debate that on another day. What we're going to do is, is we're going to look at how do we listen to our music? How do we work with our music? Because everything in our music is built 
from sound. So we can say that we're composers, but we're also, when we're saying we're a composer, we're actually a boulder of music because we're using sound. Even if it's a note on a page, it's still sound. And that sound comes from somewhere, but we'll cover that in a few, few seconds. So, Ava, that's how we pronounce her name. And yes, Ava is a she, my car is a he. <laughs> I love Ava because she has showed me everything I needed to know about life. Sound has a beginning and sound potentially has an end. Life has a beginning and potentially an end. When the Second World War started, it had a beginning. It had something that made it happen. And there was an end to that war. But we can question the beginning of the sound, the beginning of the war, the beginning of the Bible. We can question the end of the war. We can question the end of life. So these are all rhetorical, moral, or even ethical questions we can ask. There's no right answer. Ava does not ask you for a question that's black and white. She, gave, she gives you a multitude of possibilities. So if I move to our next slide, here's the thing about Ava. Ava at the moment is in 2D because I need to find the money to build the AI. So version 405 is still coming. Ava has three dimensions or spheres. So I think about a tennis ball, we bounce it, we catch it, we throw it to each other, we catch it, we play tennis, the ball is going back and forth. Ava makes you go back and forth, around, up and down, horizontal, vertical, any direction you can think of. She consists of three dimensions. Our oral dimension, what we hear, how we listen. The second dimension is gesture. So if I filter that completely down is physical movement. And the third dimension is the score, not sheet music the score, the music score. The beauty of Ava is, is Ava has a love-hate relationship with the music score, okay? Ava really, she, she can really get her knickers in a twist when, we, when we're looking at the score. But we'll cross that bridge in a second. So let's go to the next slide. First of all, I want each and everyone in this room to take their phone and switch it off. I want each and everyone who has their computer open to switch it off, close it down, and put it away. So otherwise you will not get the benefit from today. Computers away. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to put your computer actually in your bag if you can. Ava, while you're putting your stuff away, Ava has a thing about how we are with each other. And I have a thing about how we are with each other, especially as musicians. Because as musicians, we need to be able to hear each other when we perform. We need to be able to hear each other when we're rehearsing. We need to be able to hear each other when we're coming up with something brand new. I did not build this model on my own. I had the help of Claire and Diana. I had the help of Ian Stevenson when he was still here. Mitch, Mitch's input was just as valuable. So we're talking about collaboration, interacting with people, looking up, not down. You wanna look up, you wanna see what's happening. Because when we're listening, we're not just listening with our ears, we're listening with our mind and our entire physical body. And that is another big component of Ava. It's that connection between what we hear, how we move, what we feel, and what we see. Because we listen with our eyes, and we listen with our muscles, we listen with our skeletal system, 
and we listen with the cells that's flowing around in our body as our heart pumps our blood for our entire body. That entire process is informed by energy. So the other very, very, very big important component of Ava is energy. So the question is, is what did we have for breakfast? If we have a hash brown and a coffee with three shots in it, with three sugars in it, and we have that hash brown, how are we going to be if we have to perform at one o'clock? You'll probably still be on a buzz, so that's absolutely fine. I totally get that. But by the time we have to listen to the music that we're performing and being able to hear what the person next to us is doing when they're harmonizing, we need to have the right energy in our body. It's the same with this. We want to have 100% energy and 100% commitment because that is what Ava asks you to do. She asks you to be 100% committed to what you're doing and what you're engaging with. So, what I want to do is, is I'm going to play you a piece of music. I'm going to skip this slide. We're going to go here. So the piece that I'm going to play for you is called Pression. And it was created by Helmut Lachenmann. And this was one of the pieces that I actually analyzed when I was doing my research. And it was a lot of fun. It was very intense. It was so intense that I would sit down and I would analyze the music for about 10, 20 minutes, and then I'd be exhausted. And we'll get to that in a second. I was exhausted because I was using so much energy. And that's where the whole principle of what have I eaten today and what have I had to drink, because all of that informs how much energy I'm going to have to be able to sit down and analyze a piece of music. So we're looking at sound. So before we play this, I actually want to start here. If I come here, right, and I need an answer from somebody here, okay? So if I do this, where did the sound start? Where did it finish? Could you hear it finish? Okay. It could still be going, it could still be going yes. If I do this, if I do this, is it finished? Okay, tell me when it's finished. Who thinks it's finished now? Yep, awesome. Who else thinks it's finished now? It's not finished. Okay, so here's the thing, there's no right or wrong, like I said before, there's no right or wrong. So we can have 20 different opinions, and those 20 different opinions can help us to, br to build something, or to come to a conclusion, or to describe something. Do you think the sound is finished? Who here thinks that it's completely finished? Okay, fair enough. Who, th who here thinks it's not finished? Okay, why do you think it's not finished? Where is it traveling to? Thank you. So I've become obsessed with outer space. And I cannot explain to anybody here why I am obsessed with outer space. The thing is just, when we play a note from the piano and we use the pedal to make that sound extend, even me walking away from the piano right here, right now, that sound is still going somewhere. And I reckon that sound is going to places that only our subconscious is aware of. So something to think about, where does it go? In my head, that sound just went up and out, and it's still going because it's trying to reach outer space because everything is connected. So the moral of the story at this point in time is, is everything has a beginning, 
everything as a beginning. So we talk about the Big Bang, we talk about the beginning of time in a different context. We're looking at the beginning of time when we're looking at the Bible. But when we're looking at the rest of it, how many chapters are there in the Bible? How many chapters is there in a book? And where does it finish? Where does this conversation finish? And does the conversation finish? So when we're looking at and analyzing music, we want to know what are we listening to and why are we listening to it? When are we listening to it? How are we listening to it? And again, why? Who is doing it and why? Why are you rehearsing 20 times in five days? Why are we doing it? Why, 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 why? <laughs> like that little kid that goes, but why, mummy, but why? So we're going to go down to the nitty gritty of this now. Okay, so I'm going to ask everybody to just listen to this piece of music. So I just want you to listen to it. I don't want you to think of how did they do it? I just want you to listen to it. I'm not going to play this thing to go for seven minutes because that's how long the song goes for. I'll probably play about two, two, three minutes of it. And close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes and listen. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So, what's the qualities that you could hear in that? I want some. I want some ideas. Give me some ideas. What were you hearing? What qualities were you hearing? Strings. Okay. What did the string sound like? Grating. Yep, grating. Yep, grating. Anybody else? There's no right or wrong answers here. Yep. Sorry, what was that? It was like a pop. Yep, it was a pop. How would you describe that pop? Fat, thin, ugly, pretty, beautiful, slender. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. What other what other descriptions can we use for what we've just heard? Scary? Why, why scary? It sounded like it was recording and I thought it was a Yeah, yeah. And it happens. I actually had somebody tell me that some of the music that I played in, during my honor is saying that it felt like something was sitting on their chest and pressing down on it. And 
it's still legit. Everything that each and every one of you just said is legitimate. So what I can do now is, is I can go and take all those words, write it down, and add it on to my already extensive library of ways that we can describe the sounds that we heard in that music. Now, a lot of people will say, that's not music, that's just noise, that's just a lot of hooey. But it's not a lot of hooey, it's all sounds that's extremely relevant. It's about how we listen to it. So we want to know where does it start, where does it stop? So if I play this again, the first person who can hear where a sound finishes, I want you to just yell out to me and I'll press pause, okay? So I'm gonna press play again. Everybody, pick a sound, and the sound that you picked, if you hear it finish, yell out for me. Okay, you can do it all at the same time, or you can do it separately. I'm just gonna go this screen back, play this. So you're listening to for the end of a sound. I heard something stop, and I think Brendan heard it roughly about a few seconds away from me. Yes. Only one. One cello. So one cello, and the microphone is never touched. But that doesn't mean that what the other person heard or equated to a microphone being tapped it doesn't take that away from the conversation. Not at all, it's still part of the conversation because we're purely listening. I'm gonna play, again, I'm gonna play it again and I want everybody to listen to how long a sound goes for and what qualities you can hear in how long a sound goes for. That last sound, let's say it lasted for about five seconds, six seconds, six seconds, six seconds, as I'm pulling up my own words. <laughs> then there's another sound before that that feels like it goes for about 30 seconds. And then there's a sound before that right at the beginning where it sounds like something is moving, like, um, like we're rubbing something. It's a sound and it feels like it goes for about a minute. When I do this, it feels like it's elongated. It feels like it's stretched out. And that first sound in the beginning of that song, or piece, it's like it's stretched out, it becomes clear. Some, it feels like there's something um, soft and elegant about the sound in the beginning. So that's how I would describe it. How would you describe it? How would you describe that very first sound that you hear when, it, when the piece starts? Give me some descriptions. Yep, precisely. Anybody else? Give it a go. Sound like a sorry. Okay, awesome. Yes, see, this is the thing. If we, we, we forget that everything we listen to in this piece of music is informed by where we were 
before we walked into this room. It's informed by everything we're surrounded with on a daily basis. And it's informed by our own perception of how something works. And it it's the same for sound. Each and every one of us here has a specific point of view on how sound works and what it sounds like and how it informs you and your choices that you make. It's the same here. So I can tell you this is what I think. I can have four or five other people tell me what they think. We throw it into a, into a hat and we go, okay, so what do we, what do we have? So if I have to write a 600 page, um, not a 600 page, um, 600 words about this piece, and we need to do it as a group. Now we've got all this information, now we just need to put it into a format that will make sense to the person who's going to mark it. Isn't it better to work with each other instead of always saying, I, I, me, me, me? And that's the beauty of Ava. Ava asks you to set aside your prejudices. She asks you to set aside everything you think collaboration is. She asks you to be purely honest and real in how you approach your music and every sound. Okay? So when we move to physical movement, we're asking not how many motion detectors we can put on somebody and then try and analyze what they're doing with pretty graphs on a computer. No, I'm asking you, well not me, Ava as well, we're asking you to have a look and see how early or how late or when does the person activate their arm, their fingers, their hands, their feet when they're performing? And what part of their body are they activating? And how much movement goes into creating one sound? Because every physical movement has an influence on what the sound does, where it goes, how it travels, what it sounds like. Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it, um, does it feel like it's going to fall off a cliff? Does it feel like it's jumping up and down? All of those sounds is determined by how we move, and how we move is determined by what we eat. And what we eat is determined by how we feel. So how each and every one of us feel right now is going to determine how we're going to talk about this piece of music. So there's, there's a lot of things to think about. So when I, I want to show you this. This is the uh, performance of the piece that I found on YouTube, of course. And I want you to actually see how this guy <laughs> plays this, this piece. very different from what you hear when you're just listening and you don't have any visuals. I'm going to keep playing this and I'm going to keep talking as well. When you watch his movements, you can see what matches up with what you heard when we just listened because now we can connect the sound with the movement. And the last piece that we connected with is the score. See how he's moving his head? See how slightly he's moving his shoulders to the front? And look how he's leaning. He's quite literally leaning onto the cello because he's, he's trying to create pressure. And that pressure and that movement is having a direct influence on where the sound goes and the quality of the sound. So 
those slight movements of his hands, each and every movement has a beginning and an end. Every slight movement. When he goes to lean onto that cello, he begins it. But where does it begin? So if we bring the piano into the picture, because I'm standing, standing sometimes is better. Where did that sound begin? Did it begin when I hit the note with my finger? Or did it begin earlier? Where did the sound come from? Don't worry, it's not a trick question. I'm gonna show you again if I do this. Where did it begin? Yes. That's one answer. There's another answer as well. Yep. Yes. So it comes from my foot when I do that. But there's another place where it begins as well. Yep. But what about our human self? You're all correct. The sound starts the moment I decide to put my foot on the pedal. For the composer, the sound starts the moment they decide I want, to, I want the cellist to play A sharp. So it begins in the mind as well. So it begins in the mind and then it goes onto the page. And then from the page, it goes to the cellist. And from the cellist, it goes to the body, into the body of the cellist. And then he decides. He knows when he needs to do what. So the sound starts the moment the composer decides he wants the cellist to play A sharp. That's where the sound starts. And that's where the physical gesture comes into the picture. So it's not just the actions itself. So Ava asks you to have a look and see how does, where does it match up and where is the mismatch and what makes this piece so unique. What makes this piece so unique is the fact that it's one cello. And we're using awkward sounds to make something amazing. But to make it even more amazing, when we jump to the score, what's the first thing you look at in the score? The lines. Who else? I have to look at the top. What did you look at at the top? I don't know. Uh, because it generally would start at the top. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so you're right. So when we when we start at the top, where at the top of the page are we looking? And then after the title, what comes next? See the treble clef? I bet you everybody in this room went immediately for where's the treble clef and where's the bass clef? I meant bass clef. We all looked for the bass clef and we all wanted to know in what key signature is this piece written. Throw that idea out of your mind for five minutes and forget that there's a bass clef and forget about the title and who wrote it, and just look at the picture. When you look at that picture, what do you see? Funky notes. Funky notes, and otherwise known as shapes. And the shapes, yes? Yep. Yep. So we're looking at shapes, we're looking at graphs, we're looking at graphics, we're looking at funky notes, and pretty obvious rests. This in itself gives us an idea of what the texture of this piece is like. And then that matches up with what we hear in the first dimension and what we see in the physical dimension. So it becomes this loop, this never 
unending loop that never stops. And that is what Ava is about. It never stops. Sound never stops. There's no such thing as silence. Sound doesn't stop. And everything we see and everything we hear is connected with each other. That is why something as simple as switching off our phone during rehearsal can mean the difference between what a piece will sound like when you finally record it. Because when you put all those basic technological things aside, what you're getting is, is somebody who's singing on pitch. And it makes the recording even better. So these are things to think about. So I think the takeaways that I want everybody to go home with today is how much sound am I surrounded by? Because Ava asks you this, how much sound? Right here, right now, I can honestly tell everybody that I still want everybody just to be quiet, but nobody is talking because my head and my body is absorbing sound and vibrations and energy, and I just want everybody to be quiet. And it's still too much information coming in. So how much information are you taking in, and how are you going to interpret it, and how are you going to explain it to your friend or your fellow musician? So it brings in the principle of collaboration and energy. And it brings in perception, like I said in the beginning. Sound is constantly pushing silence out of the way. So-called silence, like I put it in inverted commas. It's pushing it away. But that space, that so-called space, or ma, that Toru Takamitsu talks about, it hangs there, and it creeps in, and it makes itself known through every piece of music that each and every one of you here play or create. It's constantly there. It's just a matter of knowing how to look for it. So ask yourself, like Ava asks you, where does the sound begin, where do I want it to go, and where do I want to place it? Do I want to manipulate it or do I want it to run away from me and make my piece sound really bad? Because each and every sound does that. There's some sounds we can't control. There are some sounds we can control. And this is where overmixing and overmastering can destroy a piece. Because sound has this raw quality that comes from out of our body, out of our cells. And we kind of want that to come through in the music that we're working with. So it's a beginning, it's a continuation of something, and it's an end. So when we see each other again, the idea is, is to have a really funky device that when I press play, it says, hello, my name is Ava, and how can I help you today? What piece of music do you want to listen to? Ludovico Einaudi? Do you want to listen to John Cage? What do you want to listen to? Pick a piece of music. And then she automatically plays it for you. And what does she do? She gives you everything in a three-dimensional space. This is all 2D for now. But the 3D is coming. Hopefully with the help of Star Wars people. <laughs> because they, they devised some funky technology to make some amazing things happen in film. So essentially it comes down to we need to find a new way to create music with each other. And we need to find a new way to look at the world and we need to find a new way to build relationships in our music industry. And Ava can help with that because she's asking you to put your technology down and purely listen for the smallest of details. Smallest of details, everything you can find, write it down, and then you go back to it, and then you do it again and again and again. 
That's the beauty of this. You can one day listen to a piece of music, try and find as much informa information as you can, come back the next day, do it again, and then you find new information. And you go, well, wow, I did not hear that yesterday. So she's, she's a pretty cool chick. I think she is. So I think she can bring a lot of interesting stuff to the music world, but also to other professions, which is a topic for another day. Because I've seen some interesting things happen in places like the health profession, but we'll leave that. Thank you for coming. This was fun. So when we see each other again, more stuff. Thank <laughs> you.